I'm Indy Nidell. And this is Power from Sabaton. And this is Sabaton History. For most of its history, Sweden had not been really involved in the affairs of mainland Europe. But we sent an army to the south and become a great power. Yes. Yes, I hear you just fine. Okay, yeah, we're rolling. All right, I'll talk to you later. Okay. The war within the Holy Roman Empire between the irreconcilably divided camps of Catholics and Jesuits on one side and the Lutheran Calvinist Protestants on the other had been raging for 12 years as King Gustav II Adolf of Sweden landed with 16,000 men on the shores of Pomerania in the summer of 1630. It had seemed as if the war was finally coming to an end. The imperial forces of the Habsburg Emperor and the Catholic Holy League had won victory after victory over the Protestant rebellion and had even defeated a Danish intervention. Gustav Adolf planned to succeed where the Danes had failed, choosing to intervene on the side of the Protestants and to prolong the war. See, the war between Catholics and Protestants was as much about politics and influence as it was a war about religion. And the last thing the ambitious, up-and-coming Swedish Empire wanted was Catholic interference in their realm of influence. So the king chose to intervene with the Protestants. Still, the overall success of his venture was bound with cooperation with the Protestant German dukes and knights. That aristocracy at first, however, looked upon Gustav Adolf's army not as a savior, nor even as an ally, but as a foreign invader, and yet another player on this chaotic chessboard that was later to be known as the Thirty Years' War. For now, a 16,000-man army that was quickly bolstering its ranks with both German and foreign mercenaries was just as dangerous to them as the Catholic forces were. The Swedes were an unknown quantity, and many viewed them as some sort of semi-barbaric savages who had just popped out of the Middle Ages into modernity. One of the few of the Germans that openly sided with the Swedish king was a guy called Christian Wilhelm, dispossessed mayor of the city of Magdeburg, who forced his way back to power and declared his support for the Swedes. Well, the commanders of the Holy League, the Count of Tilly and his imperial field marshal, the Earl of Pappenheim, were not about to ignore that, and their forces advanced on Magdeburg and lay siege to it. But as Magdeburg then waited for Swedish help, Gustav Adolf was not able to provide it because of the hesitation of the Protestant dukes and knights in Saxony and Brandenburg in joining him. So Magdeburg eventually fell on May 10, 1631. And that city's fall was perhaps the most terrible event of the Thirty Years' War, and certainly its worst civilian massacre, rape, Pillaging and murder were the orders of the day, and over 20,000 inhabitants were put to the sword in a drunken rage. This brutal sacking was what finally pushed the northern Protestant duchies into the King of Sweden's camp. Gustav Adolf crossed the Elbe River and moved south into Saxony to link up his now 23,000 men strong army with an additional 16,000 Saxons. The Count of Tilly with his 39,000 men rode north to engage them. The broad plains near the village of Breitenfeld was where Tilly chose to make battle. He ordered his infantry, in traditional Spanish fashion, into 17 large squares where musketeers were protected by a large force of pikemen. His 27 cannons were placed on a hill near the center. The elite heavily armored cuirassiers of the Earl of Pappenheim formed on the left, while the right wing was manned by the Duke of Furstenberg's 3,000 heavy cavalrymen and 900 mounted Croats. On the misty morning of September 17, 1631, the Swedish and Saxon troops entered the battlefield and came immediately under cannon fire. Gustav Adolf had put his men in lines known as Swedish Brigades, a new tactic of his own, with six ranks of musketeers protected by blocks of pikemen. So while relying on the power of concentrated musket fire, he could keep more men in reserve and allow his army to be more flexible. He ordered the Saxons to keep his left flank secure, and his own cavalry held the right. At midday, the Swedish artillerymen were finally firing back. 
with 68 guns, the Swedes packed not only double the amount of artillery, but their gunners were also better drilled. The Swedish artillery could fire up to three times faster than their opponents. A two-hour artillery duel saw the superior Swedish artillery take a heavy toll on the tightly packed Imperial formations. Casualties were high as the 24-pounders tore into the ranks. But the Saxons on the Swedish left, who also fought in tight formations, were also wavering under the heavy cannon fire. By 2 p.m., Pappenheim on the Imperial left had had enough of waiting around. Against Tilly's orders, he ordered his cuirassiers to move out against the Swedish infantry. The cuirassiers were the finest troops in the Imperial Army. Heavily armored from head to toe, they rode out in tight formation, and once close to an enemy, they would fire their pistols and charge with swords in hand into the decimated ranks. That at least was the theory, but discipline wasn't always that enforced and it became typical that instead of charging, the cuirassiers simply fired their pistols and then rode around the formation to let the others take their shots until the enemy was weak enough for a safe charge. This was the case at Breitenfeld, but the Swedish brigades were a natural counter to that. As the cuirassiers came close, the musket-heavy Swedish formations concentrated their fire in a deadly salvo as all ranks fired at once. Each time the cuirassiers moved into fire, they were met by a murderous hail of bullets and repulsed. At the same time, on the other flank, the already shaken Saxons were attacked by Furstenberg's cavalry and the fearsome Croats. The Saxon infantry offered stiff resistance initially, but eventually broke and ran from the battlefield with Furstenberg's men in hot pursuit. Tilly who had forbidden both of his commanders to ride out on their own, now saw his chance to roll up the Swedes from the flank. He ordered his men to advance, shifting his whole army to swing around. But his tightly packed formations were slow, and before the right wing of the infantry could move into the gap the Saxons had left behind, Gustav Adolf was able to send his second line in to meet the Imperial advance. So while the Swedes had withheld a strong tactical advance, the Imperials were now overextending themselves. The whole center shifted to the right to avoid gaps of their own, and the smoke of the guns and the dust of marching feet created chaos on the field. The Catholics cheered for Father Tilly or yelled Jesus Maria to identify themselves in the melee. The Swedish battle cry was Gott mit uns, an old saying the Teutonic Knights used in the Baltics and which originated from early Christian times. Soon, Pappenheim was forced to call off his attack. His cuirassiers had taken the worst in the engagement by far. Seeing Pappenheim's men wavering, though, Gustav Adolf ordered a counterattack of his own. The Swedish cavalry advanced, immediately routing the cuirassiers, and then turned on the weekend and now exposed left flank of the Imperial front line. The battle had dramatically shifted in favor of the Swedes. Now, they were the ones outflanking the Imperials as the Swedish right wing moved up. Furstenberg's cavalry had exhausted themselves in pursuing the Saxon infantry and plundering their baggage, and they in turn were now met by the Swedish reserves and Saxony's household cavalry. Tilly's infantry was mauled by the stronger Swedish firepower. Without cavalry to fear, the Swedish proved superior in open battle. And as Tilly's cannons were taken by the Swedish encircling move, the battle turned into a disaster for the Imperials. Tilly ordered a full retreat before being totally surrounded. Discipline held for a few moments, but as the Swedes brought their cannons into range, the battle was effectively over and the Imperials ran for the hills. Gustav Adolf had lost around 2,000 of his men and 1,500 Saxons, while 7,000 Catholics and Imperials lay dead on the battlefield. A further 6,000 became prisoners and were immediately pressed into the Swedish ranks. Tilly himself was wounded, but was able to escape. For the Swedes, this was a resounding victory. The next day, the Protestant propaganda machine was in full motion. A glorious victory, divine retribution for Magdeburg. The lion from the north had triumphed over the imperial eagle. In fact, the Catholics had suffered their first major defeat since the beginning of the war, and the Protestants all over Germany were again taking up arms. The Battle of Breitenfeld was not only 
a demonstration of the superior skill and tactics of the Swedish monarch, it also made Gustav Adolf larger than life. He was hailed almost as a biblical figure like Joshua or, or a new Alexander, who would now march south towards Vienna and then even Rome itself. Gustav Adolf mania gripped the Protestant strongholds and men began styling their beards like the Swedish king. But you know, it's a long way to Vienna. And although he had achieved a spectacular victory, his enemies were anything but beaten. 20,000 of the emperor's men were already forming in Silesia, and Tilly was determined to raise a new army to avenge his defeat. For the moment, the Swedes were forced to make camp for winter and gather more support for the battles yet to come. The war, which had seemed over weeks earlier, was beginning again and would continue for nearly two more decades. He was yeah. the Elvis of 1632. That was, that was Gustav Adolf. Can we get a picture, please? Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. So everybody start doing their very like that again. Okay, Gothmittons, I mean, you know, this was obviously a major, a major turning point in Swedish history. Now, the song itself, how do you see it musically? The music for this one. It yeah. sounds very much like uh, some some melodies are traditional folk, Swedish folk music. Yeah. And that was the whole idea, you know, when we were doing the Carolus Rex album, we took a lot of impressions and ideas from Swedish folk music. Really? And uh, normally we write always the music and we don't care about the topic and we add the topic as a secondary layer onto the music. But we knew that we were working on Carolus Rex and we felt as well when, uh, when the song was recorded like, Oh my God, it's, it's a very, very funny song. It's a very uplifting song. It should be a crowd favorite. It's something that we really want to perform live. Everybody in the band was always excited about playing it and still today. And, and funny enough, I mean, doing the recording for it, um, there are some vocal lines that, that is being sung not by Joachim, but it's supposed to be sung by band members. But at this uh -huh. time, the band members didn't show up this day. Funny enough. Funny enough. Uh, during you think recording. they were very responsible being musicians. And, uh, and in the morning instead, the producer of this album, Peter Tektgren, decided to do the vocal lines himself. Oh, okay, everybody's. And, and he, he, he was doing that really well. And, it sound, and we also performed live with him a couple of times where he came onto the stage and performing his parts. Okay. If he's not there, yeah. It's usually sung that like one of the verses is sung by uh, by one guitar player and one by the other one, okay. and then we all fill in. And it, there has been parts sometimes when we have performed this song even without Joachim on the stage. And he gets his bathroom break. He gets a bathroom break or whatever yeah. he wants to probably do during that time. Isn't. He probably drinks a beer because it also, you know, we, we change the lyrics a little bit around to funny because yeah. in Germany when we play, some people um, always shout. Instead of Sabaton, Sabaton, they shout Noch ein Bier, Noch, noch ein, ein Bier. Bier. <laughs> and uh, so, wait, wait, can we, can we, ins can we insert a chant of that? <laughs> we decided, okay, let's change the lyrics one night. Uh, as we all drink together, drink forever, noch ein Bier. <laughs> now, have you played it recently in any of your shows here? It's been a while since we performed the song, but I'm sure that we bring it back every now and then. It's a great song for us to play. There are, there are songs who are more and less fun to play for yeah. us as band members. Prima Victoria is one of those songs. It's, it's horrible as a musician because the song is so simple, yeah. but it becomes powerful yeah, to crowd, play. Yeah. But Gott mit uns has, it's fun to play as a musician, yeah, it's an uplifting song and it's a crowd favorite. Well, I, I want to end this today. I want everybody to help me out here. Noch ein Bier, noch ein Bier, noch ein Bier, noch ein Bier. See you next time on Sabaton History. That's it for this week's of Sabaton History Channel. Remember, if you're a patron, you can get the Sabaton albums in a very nice uh, edition featuring Indy Nidell talking about the history behind the songs. So, check that out. Ooh.